Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, as uh, she said, we know this is the last session of the day, so we'll keep the energy incredibly high. Um, but Connor and I are, are here today to chat um, a whole lot about ML um, production tech stacks. And this talk is really motivated from a lot of the work that we've gotten to do with customers and sort of aggregating this, this feedback that we, or questions that we sort of continually answer and kind of putting them together um, in this survey so we've got it all in one place and can, can kind of talk through things end to end. So quick intro. Um, as she said, my name is Mary Grace Mesta. I'm a data science consultant at Databricks. So I spend a whole lot of my time working with our awesome customers, uh, building out some of the coolest end-to-end -end ML solutions out there. Awesome. Thanks, Mary Grace. Uh, and hello, my name is Connor Murphy. So I'm the lead data scientist and manager here at Databricks. So I've been working on distributed ML production systems for over half a decade at this point. Um, and when I started off in this space, when I started off as a data scientist, I had this running joke with one of my roommates, which was that my career goal in data science was to figure out what the hell a data scientist was, because that was a point in time where like, we weren't sure if it was you know, an Excel user, a Python user, but things have definitely firmed up a bit since then. Um, but I always enjoy working at kind of the cutting edge of like where we don't quite yet have standards and best practices. And that's very much the case when it comes to operationalizing machine learning. So happy to share some of those best practices with you. So this is the high-level landscape. Um, and so there is actually a bit of a typo within your agenda today. It's not a 35-minute session. It's about a 35-week session. We're going to get some cots in the back, and we're going to go through this in a lot of detail. Um, just kidding. But as you can imagine, the ML technology landscape is getting more and more complex as time goes on. And so I get a lot of questions from a lot of different customers asking things like, you know, what about Neptune? What about weights and biases? How does that compare to ML flow? You know, what is Selden? And like, is that a good, you know, choice for machine learning model serving? So there are so many different tools out there that we really want to drill down into some of the standards and best practices as this area starts to um, uh, mature. So at a high level, one of the core problems is not only do we have this diversity of different tools, but also building your own ML platform is really expensive. So it's only a handful of different companies that are really you know, heavily, heavily investing in building their own ML platforms in-house. And they're oftentimes quite buggy. They're not optimized in quite the way that they should be. There are all sorts of challenges associated with it. And so if we can have better standards and best practices, then we can start to you know, get away from this idea that we need you know, a team of Kubernetes engineers to be managing you know, a, an internal ML platform. And the main cost associated with software is not in its original development, it's in its long-term maintenance. And so because of that, you know, managing your own ML um, platform can be quite, quite expensive. So when it comes to a solution, we want some sort of standardized tech stack. We want to make sure that we're, we are attracting best-in-class talent who are working on you know, exactly the types of libraries they want to work on. And when it comes to better enabling data teams, it's an art, not a science, because you want to be able to provide different best practices that allow data scientists to show up with whatever tools are most intuitive to them, but you also don't want it to be the full Wild West. And so what's the best balance between standards and best practices and allowing data science to have their own choose your own adventure when it comes to the libraries and tools that they're using? So. We're going to start off talking about something that's a little bit outside of core technology stacks, which is something that we see come up time and time again in a number of different customer accounts. And this is kind of the elephant in the room that also you know, helps inform the way that we navigate these technology stacks. And that's how do we organize our data teams? And so this is something that, you know, as consultants, Mary Grace and I work with a number of different customers. And then oftentimes you see, you know, what works and what doesn't work in terms of organizing those teams to best leverage the different technology stacks that they have. So we're going to start off there. Then we're going to go through features of the ML platform, and we're going to do a deep dive into some of those. So to start off with organizing ML teams, so like, like I said, you know, data science when I started wasn't necessarily that firm of a thing. Um, that's kind of the case right now with machine learning engineering, right? So we kind of know what a data engineer is, right? Data engineers manage these data pipelines. A data scientist manages, you know, creates these proof of concepts and, you know, figures out some way to mathematically model different business problems that they have. But when it comes to machine learning engineers, like that's, you know, a persona that's really, you know, starting to firm up. But it's still something, you know, that in industry we oftentimes lack good knowledge as to what to do with them and how best to organize those teams. So I wanted to start off just by saying what doesn't seem to work. 
And so these are, this is something that I've seen come up time and time again, which is initially an organization sees that they should be using data. Um, and so the first thing that they do is like, oh, this seems like technology. We should put it under IT. Um, and generally speaking, like when like I see a data team that's positioned under IT rather than as its own department, um, that really makes me question whether or not they're significantly prioritizing that. And I will say that IT is generally speaking optimizing very different incentives. And so because of that, they're much more concerned about security, reliability, that sort of thing, which oftentimes is at odds with data scientists who need to be able to more iteratively, you know, uh, work with different pipelines, more iteratively work on their different solutions that they might have. But, okay. Next up is data scientists continue to manage production models after they've put them into production. So they create some sort of you know, ML model, they put it into production, and then they're the person who has to continue to maintain that. And that limits their ability to pivot and focus on a new data science task. And so it used to be you know, more um, uh, common to talk about agile data science. I think we talk about it a little bit less as an industry now. Um, but this idea that you know, the optimal way of getting value from a data science group is to get them focusing on a bunch of different problems and get them you know, working in somewhat of an agile way. Um, if you want that style of agile data science, or if you want to make sure that your data science are, uh, scientists are focusing on their highest ROI tasks, you need some sort of way of managing these handoffs. Because time and time again, we see that the original data scientists who created a model are spending way too much time dealing with different you know, patches and security issues and whatever else as they manage these models in production. But, okay. So next we have a machine learning engineering team is created but struggles with handoffs. So this is kind of you know, a point of mutual frustration across data scientists and machine learning engineers. The data scientists are concerned because they say, hey, I gave you this model, it's not in production, it's been months, why is that the case? And the machine learning engineers are frustrated because they have to refactor everything because there weren't the best standards and best practices so that they could do that handoff. Um, so we see that quite a bit as well. Then we have data pipelining teams struggling to update pipelines, and so data scientists need to be able to iteratively access data. If you're using you know, a more traditional uh, data model, if you're using data warehouses, star schemas, that sort of thing, those become hard for data scientists to work with because they need to be able to iteratively create their own data sets. And then finally, local development doesn't translate to production systems. I'm seeing this a lot less now, now that you know, the, the industry is really converging on cloud technologies and it's so much more common to train remotely than it is to train on your uh, local system. But figured I mentioned it as well. So when it comes to what does seem to work, so there are a couple of different overall um, structures that seem to work relatively well. So first off is an embedded approach. And so you embed a machine learning engineer on each one of your different teams. And so certain teams in Google, I think, have done this to a certain degree of success. That seems to work relatively well, but this centralized machine learning engineering teams, that seems to be a lot more common at this point. And so you need some sort of way of separating out these two teams and then having the handoffs. And that's something that Mary Grace will be talking about in quite a bit more detail, which is you know, how to best have those you know, end-to-end -end solutions that allow you to better do that handoff. And then one other thing that's worth mentioning is you know, the, the so-called like centralized data engineering approach, where you have one monolithic repo for all of your ETL data engineering, um, and then you allow data scientists to have more lightweight repos where they're reading from those larger ETL pipelines and then processing from there. So all that to say is you know, the, the key of having these effective handoffs is clearly enforced standards, clearly enforced standard operating procedures, and Mary Grace will talk to us a little bit about that. Awesome. So when Connor and I were sort of thinking about how we wanted to organize this talk, we ended up coming up with you know, the core features of an ML platform. And so these are the four core components that we have you know, come up with that we think, hey, these, these are what define an ML platform. So the first is the core tech stack. So this includes things like the language that you're using, um, collaboration, so whether you're doing de development in source notebooks, IDEs, the libraries that you're using, the cloud or clouds that you're deploying this on, um, and any ETL processes that sit you know, before the actual modeling takes place. The second is the actual data and modeling portion. So this is where we think about tracking all of the metadata that's associated with you know, the execution of data science code. So think hyperparameters, think metrics, think um, metadata about your training data, all of that kind of stuff, as well as things like governance. So this was somewhat twofold because we not only need to govern the, the, the data itself, but we need to govern the model and the process that we're, that we're using to train as well. 
as well as the admin side. So understanding what the cost implication of this process is um, and you know, the kind of users that are consuming this. The third portion is the actual ML workflow. So this is where we think about things like CICD. So how is the flow of artifacts in and out of production going to work? Um, how is the orchestration of that flow going to work? What does testing look like? What are those testing requirements? And then what does the retraining sch schedule look like? And then the last piece is deployment. And so again, this encompass encompasses the different modalities of deployment, whether we're doing batch deployment, real time, um, streaming deployments, or even edge deployments. And then when we think about deployments, we also have to think about how is our model doing in these production states? How can we effectively monitor it? What are these thresholds that we need to set to make sure that our model is still doing good in production? And then also things like A-B testing. So as we think about the retraining process and if our model isn't doing well, how can we effectively you know, push a new model into production with minimal disruption to our users? And so as we start to kind of go through this, this survey of, of tech stacks, um, we do want to come out to say that you know, we have an opinionated approach. You know, we, we do come from Databricks. We've worked with MLflow a whole lot. And so you know, we believe that MLflow solves a lot of these or hits a lot of those core pieces of the, the ML platform that I just mentioned. And one of the big things, too, that, that Connor and I want to call out here is the community adoption of MLflow, which <laughs> the... It's ML flow, it's up here, not just flow. But um, <laughs> the community adoption is a big thing. So if you look at the PyPy stats that are up in the corner of, of that, um, of the slide here, um, this is a big thing that, that I'll keep coming back to as well, is, is we have a massive community behind ML flow, which means that there's huge support in terms of documentation, there's huge support of if we think of what this product, this is going to look like down the road as well as it's open source, right? So if we think about any um, requirements we have about not being bound into certain technologies, the open bounds of MLflow, again, can, can help really um, soothe any of those concerns. And so I think folks in the room, um, if you attended the keynotes today, um, have a good idea of what MLflow is. But if you're watching at home and maybe watching a couple weeks from now and not quite sure what MLflow is, we just wanted to sort of put a bit of a primer out there um, to define or to talk about the core components of MLflow. So there's MLflow tracking, which is again where you can record and query all of that metadata I referred to a couple minutes ago associated with the execution of data science code. There is MLflow projects. So again, this is the reproducible packaging format so you can ship off your, your ML code as one um, entity. There's MLflow models, which is the generic model format that you use that supports a diverse um, suite of deployment tools. So if we think about those, all those different modalities, MLflow is that tool that kind of unifies um, an approach to be able to serve across all those different modalities. And then there's the MLflow model registry. So this really comes into play when we think about the orchestration and CICD piece and the tracking of models, um, the actual artifacts themselves as they go from a development phase to a staging phase, go through testing, end up in production, and even as they're sunsetted out of production. And then as we think about the implementation details here, um, there are APIs that back MLflow. So we've got CLIs, Python, R, Java, and REST APIs. So again, we kind of have a, a pretty diverse set of APIs so we can kind of bring our own tools here and make sure that it fits in the right way. And so if we think about how these core pillars fit into the ML lifecycle, we can kind of see that all here through this, through this visual. And this is, again, why we have this opinionated approach of let's go ahead and use MLflow. So if we think about the core pieces of technology, of, of collaboration, we can um, leverage um, Databricks notebooks or an, any notebook setting, really, as well as IDEs, and track all of the work that's happening in IDEs through not only a code versioning tool, but also track you know, the hyperparameters we're using in that code all through MLflow. And also, as we start to think about the featureization process, um, the tracking of the ETL processes, we can leverage Delta as well to be able to track the historic um, the historic views of that data, as well as more current views to make sure that we have reproducibility across these pipelines as well. And then again, as we think about the orchestration and deployment side, that's where we really lean on the MLflow model registry to be able to connect with webhooks, to make those automatic transitions of models into different stages and deploy them into um, the right modalities. And so if we think about what the MLflow or what the ML workflow um, ecosystem looks like, um, we 
kind of put together a list of tools that we see really, really frequently in the field. Mm -hmm. So MLflow is definitely one of them. Uh, weights and biases is another frequent one. Um, TensorBoard, and then a lot of um, cloud-specific tools. So the SageMakers of the world, the Azure MLs of the world, the Vertex AIs of the world. And one of the big things that I encourage folks to think about as you think about these you know, ML workflow tools mm -hmm. is first and foremost, um, the, open, the openness of them, right? So are we dealing with open source technologies? Um, and the big reason for that is because we want to make sure that within our tech stacks, we aren't gonna be binded to certain things um, because processes change, right? Requirements change over time. And so we wanna make sure that we have tools that are flexible enough to support those changes over time. The other thing is, is the community behind these tools. And so that's the big thing that I'll continue to refer to. And so that's why I really encourage you to take a look at like that downloads, um, that downloads column there on the far, the far right hand side is because the community behind these tools is really important. Because if we think about building you know, an ML platform off of a tool that, that doesn't have a lot of community behind it, the problem is somewhat twofold, right? Of, if we think about the long-term life cycle of this project within, within our company, right? If we build it in a specific tool that data scientists two, three, four years from now aren't gonna know, that's gonna create more technical debt for us to have to you know, dig ourselves out of. And so if we back up a little bit too and think about one of those additional uh, core pieces of the ML platform, one of them is language choice. And um, this is, again, something where I really encourage folks to think about the community support behind things. Um, so I, you know, I've worked with customers where R and SQL were the first class languages of their data science community. And so they were really eager to build all of you know, their, their pipelines in R and SQL. And they were able to do that with bringing in open source libraries, handling the ETL and SQL. Um, however, because there's so much more of a community behind Python, and we see a lot more of the field moving to Python, you know, we encourage them to say, hey, let's, let's invest time up front to have our data science community level up in Python, build these pipelines in Python, because two, three, four years down the line, as these pipelines are being managed, you know, the Python community will continue to grow. And so as we bring in new data scientists, it's gonna be much harder for them to try to maintain a legacy pipeline in R and SQL than something that's moving towards industry standard like Python is. And so these are the kind of the things that, that we encourage customers con to consider as they you know, start to, to think about which, you know, which item should I choose when it comes to language. Now Python, I can say, is, is definitely an, an easier choice here. Um, again, two, three, four years ago, that might have been a little bit different. Well, we definitely see the community moving you know, full-fledged towards Python. And then the next piece is a collaboration. And so this kind of manifests in a couple different ways. We have the code versioning tools, so the, the Gits of the world, um, GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket, those, those tools, as well as the actual IDs themselves. So notebooks like Jupyter, PyCharm. And the big thing to consider here too is to kind of echo what Connor was saying, is you have to think about how your ML teams are structured. Right? If, you, if you're setting standards by having these embedded teams of you know, your, your DevOps teams, engineering teams work in GitHub, um, and you have these embedded teams, you, it's best to keep that standard, right? You wanna make sure that there's consistency across these embedded teams. And then in terms of you know, that backend tool or the, the notebook-based tools like uh, PyCharm and Jupyter, it's all about, again, thinking about what's gonna be maintainable for the team long-term. And so I'll turn it over to Connor now to finish a little bit more about some additional surveys of tools and how we see that manifest in the field. Gotcha. Thanks, Mary Grace. So we'll talk a little bit about uh, Python libraries, and then we'll talk about CI/CD as well, because CI/CD is very much, you know, not a solved issue right now when it comes to uh, machine learning and data science. So we'll talk about some of those complexities. Uh, but first off, I don't know if anybody has seen the Twitter war that has been raging for the last fortnight. Um, but so uh, there's been a lot of conversation that uh, resurfaced quite recently about uh, PyTorch versus TensorFlow. Um, and this is something that's come up time and time again. Uh, but I think this uh, quote from Francois Chalet, who's original creator of Keras, um, was quite uh, telling about this. And so he says, the thing is applied ML engineers have opposite needs to those of researchers. When you do applied machine learning, you need a framework that's feature complete, reasonably prescriptive, high level, that guides you towards industry best practices. And of course, you want it to be production ready. 
And so for us, it's always the you know, emphasis on this, path, on this last sentence, the production ready piece. Um, so currently where it seems to stand is that PyTorch is, has far more publications associated with it than TensorFlow does. However, in industry, TensorFlow still seems to be reigning supreme. So if you look at PyPy downloads, you know, TensorFlow is uh, ahead by a pretty wide margin. Um, but I don't think you really necessarily always have to take sides. And so for us, like in the different customer accounts that I've worked in, I've yet to see a customer that is using uniquely PyTorch. They're, like if they are using PyTorch, they're also using TensorFlow. And the majority of the customers that I work with are using uniquely TensorFlow. And the core reason for that is because the suite of production tools that you have available within TensorFlow is significantly more mature um, than what you have currently within PyTorch. And so I know that could definitely be a flame war. I know people have some strong opinions either way. And certain tools like PyTorch Lightning have been coming quite along, uh, qu quite far. But at the end of the day, TensorFlow does seem to have quite a strong uh, market grasp when it comes to, um, um, yeah, how well they're doing in production specifically. But okay, cool. So when it comes to different Python libraries, um, so these are kind of a lot of the standard libraries that you see come up time and time again. There are a few that I really want to highlight here. Um, and so first and foremost, a lot of the work that we do um, has to do with distributed machine learning. So that's, you know, you have more data than you fit on any one machine. How do you actually process that? Um, and so when we make like recommendations surrounding Python libraries, we usually have distribution back of mind. Um, and so Specifically, when it comes to those libraries that you can distribute, um, it's just worth highlighting sklearn is a single node library, um, as is pandas. And so pandas, you know, for pandas data frame, you, like, you're limited by the amount of memory that you have on the machine that you're running that, and similar to sklearn. So if you're interested in distributed libraries, there are really three, maybe four main libraries that you want to take a deep dive into. Um, so XGBoost and LightGBM, those seem to be pretty much at parity in terms of overall market penetration, which is actually kind of surprising because you know, XGBoost was you know, ahead for quite a while. And LightGBM, if you're less familiar with it, it offers similar tree-based methods, but it has some really crafty ways of doing optimizations. So you don't have to redo the training, each you know, uh, iteration of your training steps across all of your data. Um, and so LightGBM is definitely interesting to take a look at. And then, of course, there's Spark machine learning as well. And so Spark machine learning has a lot of the classical machine learning algorithms, but it's not going to be as robust or fully featured as what you have with an sklearn. But the idea is that you, know, you might not have as many algorithms or as many hyperparameters to tune, but for virtue of the fact that you're using all of your data rather than just a subset of your data, Spark ML works quite well for those use cases. The next one I wanted to highlight was one uh, library that isn't particularly well known, but it's something that we use uh, pretty regularly, which is Horovod. Um, so Horovod was launched by Uber a number of years ago, and specifically it was designed to be able to distribute uh, TensorFlow and PyTorch uh, training. I think it works with MXNet, but I don't see too much MXNet anymore. Um, and so all that to say is, um, within Horovod, XGBoost, and LightGBM, they all have the same basic style of distribution, which is you're plugging them into Spark, you're using Spark in order to distribute all of your data and all of your computation, um, and that allows you to avoid having to set up a Ray server or a DAS server or something like that. Um, so there's also a Ray's been getting a fair amount of market penetration recently. Um, however, I will say that our core recommendation is still to use Spark um, because, you know, for those Spark clusters, you have that provision for you. There can be some crafty ways of running Ray on Spark. And so if you're at all interested in that, uh, one of my colleagues wrote a blog article on it. So you can find it within our engineering blog. Stephen offers his name. And I'm sure if you search Databricks blog Ray, you'll find it there. Um, so hopefully that gives you a sense of you know, like what the popular libraries are, but also like specifically if you're coming at this from a dis distributed context, like these are the heavy hitters that you really want to look at. Um, and I will say that for certain libraries, like XGBoost in particular, some people build their entire you know, ML production stack off of that. So I had one customer in particular who they only used XGBoost for everything. And so all of their production code was just like, how can they use, like, you know, productionalize those XGBoost models? They didn't have anything that would allow for other libraries, but that actually worked surprisingly well for them because XGBoost, generally speaking, works quite well. 
So that's not the core recommendation that I would make. Really, you want to be able to allow um, your data scientists to use whatever libraries are most intuitive for them. And so if you're using a tool like MLflow, what you're effectively doing is when you're logging those models, you're logging it with the environment that was used in the training, a bunch of metadata associated with that as well. And so your deployment engineers don't have to worry about what underlying library was used in the initial training process. You have abstracted that away, and so you can have your deployment engineers, your machine learning engineers, however you want to language it, so those individuals are able to just grab those model artifacts and deploy them in a relatively seamless way. So I mentioned that CICD isn't necessarily a solved thing when it comes to data science. So when it comes to CI-CD, so this is continuous integration, continuous delivery, or continuous deployment, um, this looks a little bit different than what you've seen within traditional CI-CD. So traditional CI-CD, right, you push new code, you test it, you bundle up an artifact, and then you ship it off into production. When it comes to machine learning models, we care about uh, everything you see within normal CI-CD plus two main characteristics. So you care about continuous monitoring and the way that we monitor these models. Sometimes it looks like infrastructure monitoring. There's also a number of different um, you know, techniques and tools. You know, we're looking at how that model performs, not just whether it errors out. So you care about continuous monitoring, and then you care about retraining processes. And so like these like make basically, you know, CI-CD when it comes to ML, not quite as much of a solved problem. So you might have seen the keynote earlier today. So we launched MLflow Pipelines, which is a really cool way of keeping organized when it comes to these different steps within a CI-CD process. Um, but there's also just a host of different other tools out there. And so the current state of CI-CD is you're getting a sense for, you know, what's your orchestration framework going to look like? What's your testing framework? You know, how are you going to trigger these events based upon some uh, Git hook or web hook? How are you going to monitor, et cetera, et cetera? So really the state of this like, um, domain is that you're like, choosing these different technologies and stitching them together. Um, we'll talk a little bit about multi-cloud towards the end and different tools that you can enable to make sure that you don't get locked into any one particular cloud. Um, but all that to say is, you know, if you take a look at the open source column, this gives you tools that are going to abstract, you know, are going to work just fine regardless of the cloud that you're working on. Um, and then otherwise, you have a bunch of this built within Databricks, and then you have, you know, different cloud providers and third-party providers as well. So when it comes to deployment, there are a bunch of different technologies out there. I will say the majority of REST endpoints right now are backed by KServe capacity. And so KServe is a Kubernetes-backed REST endpoint. And so you'll see a number of these different companies popping up. So Selden is one example of this, um, where you have a bunch of these different companies that are basically building managed solutions backed by this project called KServe. And so Kubernetes is you know, an incredible piece of technology. KServe is backed by Kubernetes. You can do all sorts of really crafty things uh, when it comes to REST deployments. But at the end of the day, it's quite difficult to provision. And so what I see most enterprise customers doing is they're uh, using managed services rather than trying to build and um, uh, maintain Kubernetes clusters themselves. So if you want something that's cloud-based managed, there are a bunch of these different things out there. And so we have Databricks model serving. We have a lot of internal development going towards that. Um, and then in each of your cloud environments, you have AWS SageMaker, you have Azure's Kubernetes service. So Azure ML is kind of the umbrella term. And then Azure Kubernetes service is a um, a tool within Azure ML that allows you to do distributed REST deployments. Um, and then you have Vertex AI as well. And I'll say Vertex AI is kind of the one that stands out here because like SageMaker and Azure Kubernetes Service, they're both Docker-backed solutions, whereas Vertex AI can be a little bit um, uh, more manual in the way that you use it. And so it's not quite the Docker-backed solution that you would have within SageMaker or Kubernetes Service. And so all that to say is, you know, kind of bringing back uh, MLflow into this is that within MLflow, you can use it to generate a Docker container that you're then hosting on any of these different environments. So it gives you a tool for deployment that allows you to more seamlessly deploy as REST. So I want to mention a little bit about high-level trends before we wrap up. Um, and so, like, the current trends, like, we're seeing this continuation of what we've seen for quite a while, right? So it's open source software, it's cloud, it's data, it's AI, right? And so, you know, this is kind of the larger ma uh, macro trend that I think we're all pretty familiar with at this point. Um, what seems to be coming up next is this idea of multi-cloud. 
Um, and so multi-cloud is particularly interesting. And so this is you know, an older quote by uh, Gartner, who's basically saying by 2021, over 75% of mid-size and large organizations will have adopted a multi-cloud and or hybrid IT strategy. And so we're seeing more and more interest in these multi-cloud deployments that allow you to abstract away the cloud layer. And the reason why that's important is because we're concerned, a lot of companies are concerned about vendor lock-in. And so all that to say is these different tools, so Kubernetes being one of them, like Databricks is something that works on any cloud, like these other tools that are coming online seem to be you know, really riding these tailwinds of individuals who want to make sure that they have multi-cloud deployments. Also, AutoML is actually getting quite good. Um, and so for a while, AutoML was very much like a black box. And so you would you know, run some sort of AutoML, build a bunch of automated machine learning models, not really know how they worked, but they would kind of give you some inputs and outputs. So AutoML is advancing quite quickly. And so there's PyCarrot. Databricks has its own version of AutoML as well. And these are so-called glass box solutions. And so there you actually have the code that you can edit and you can iterate from there. So it avoids having to write as much boilerplate as you might have had to before. And then, like I mentioned, CI, CD is very much, you know, or to a certain extent, it's an open question. And so hopefully the ML flow pipelines that you saw earlier today give you a good sense of how to do that uh, within the ML flow environment. And if you're not specifically using ML flow for it, you can replicate that same basic structure of here's my feature engineering pipeline, here's my training pipeline, here's my scoring pipeline, here's my monitoring pipeline. Um, and then you can execute those as appropriate. So, to wrap up, um, just to leave you with a couple thoughts. So first off, thinking critically about um, how your team members are organized is a significant, significant consideration um, that oftentimes is as important as the technology stack that you're choosing. And so I do think that this is one thing that systematically as an industry, we're not very good at talking about. Um, and so thinking critically about how you organize those teams is of critical importance. You want to choose these unified, usually open tech stacks over than fo other than, uh, instead of focusing on individual tools. Because stitching together individual tools, there's always a big context switch and overhead associated with that. And finally, we mentioned MLflow. MLflow can really manage different parts of this end-to-end -end pipeline. It is fully open source, so you don't have to worry about being locked into some Databricks-specific thing. Like MLflow has really brought this industry or really helped provide standards and best practices around deployment. And so you can use this in any environment, but it does seem to simplify so much of this process. So cool. I appreciate you all listening at, on the, the last day of our conference, uh, but we have a couple minutes left if we uh, have any questions. Thank you. Okay, who's got questions? Are there specific vendors that you particularly like um, for, for a new company that you would be advising? Like, is there like some staples company that you would always recommend in specific use cases? Um, do, do you have something specific in mind, like for a specific set of products? Um, if we're thinking just I don't know, data transformation. Is there specific vendors that you typically go to or know or? Yeah, I mean, like a lot of what we do is like within Databricks. And so like Databricks, like, yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit biased in, in that regard. Um, DBT is something that we've seen come up like time and time again on the uh, data transformation piece. And I mean, like really at the end of the day, like our eyes are towards like open standards that allow you to like really have wide like market penetration. And there are, you know, so many companies that are doing like some niche things with like, you know, moderately well-documented APIs and like that, that sort of thing. But at the end of the day, like it's not just about like what the market is doing now, but it's, you know, who's going to be around in a couple years. And so it's, you know, how active are those open source projects? How many committers do you have associated with it? Um, and so, like, that's really how we, yeah, make a lot of those decisions. I'm not sure if you had any other Yeah, no, I, I think we kind of evaluate on the, on the same criteria, right? It's, it's about finding things that are relevant now, but will continue to be relevant and, and well-supported and well-developed in two, three, four, five years from now. Yeah, and I, I will say that my, I, I always just have an eye for simplicity with any, like, any solution. And I do not, like, like, at the like the beginning of my career, I would chase all of, like these different technologies, and like they wouldn't be maintained, and then you know your code would break, you know, six months later. Um, and so at this point, like I look for really simple, basic solutions that you can use time and time again. I don't chase new technologies at all. Um. All right, coming your way. Um, 
So speaking of tools becoming irrelevant, um, out of all the tools that you've showed us so far, are there any that are that you think that are particularly at risk of becoming irrelevant um, in the next five to ten years? Um, I think, like like legacy pr proprietary ML is something that I'm still surprised it's around to the degree that it is. And like those companies who have like proprietary ML solutions were normally you know, like gain that level of success because they were able to get into these different university programs and, you know, have these big contracts with usually academic organizations. Um, and so, like, yeah, anything proprietary ML is something that I steer pretty, pretty far away from. Um, and then, like, there are certain things, like, especially within monitoring right now, like, monitoring is, like, really, really interesting. You have a couple of these different projects that are kind of uh, up and coming, but that's something I'm quite cautious around because, a lot of those libraries are like high level wrappers over like like you know like basic statistics and i would much rather do it you know outside of those libraries because i have no idea how well they're going to be maintained because some of them are you know true community packages that don't have you know a, like a, a company like dedicated engineers that are iterating on it good i'm hoping this is an easy one um, within the databricks ecosystem we're still using emails for our alerts. Is there a better option that we should be aware of? <laughs> I, so I, I hear you. I, I've, I've put in that uh, uh, feature request before. <laughs> so so there, there are a couple different options. So what I normally do is I just build basic like Slack or Microsoft team alerts. And so I just have you know, a really basic simple function. It does a post request to those endpoints. And that gets me into like, Slack and Teams. That's like the quickest, dirtiest way of doing alerting. Um, and then there are some other options. In AWS, there's a way of like, basically integrating back to your like, AS, AWS alerting framework. Um, I don't, the last time I checked, and this was a little while back, there wasn't an equivalent within Azure, but that could have changed at this point. But it's, it's crazy how far you can get with just basic post requests to Slack. That seems to work great. And then otherwise, you know, you can integrate with PagerDuty or that sort of thing as well. Yeah, but I, I echo the sentiments that, you know, like email alerts aren't necessarily always as full featured as you'd like. All right, we're getting close to time. I'll take you over here. Cool. Yeah, maybe one more question. Uh, our team has been debating about the closed loop uh, architecture. Um, so for our machine learning data sets, like we need to label them, and it, it does well for a while, and then it drifts, the model drifts. Uh, the idea is to relabel them every once in a while uh, in that closed loop architecture, but uh, we looked at label box, it's just such an overkill, <laughs> and uh, it could be, um, it's a proprietary solution, uh, but I wanted to get your thoughts on like, any open source way to uh, trigger when when the model drift automatically trigger the uh, to democratize you know getting more labels in our data. Did you have an answer for that, or you want me to take it? Uh, yeah, you can start. That's fine. Okay. Yeah. So. so um, yeah, it's a good question. Like, um, I'm sure you saw um, Andrew Ning's presentation earlier today, and like he's been working on that project for a little while, like the labeling project. Um, and so like, I'm trying to think if there's you know, better solutions for your specific use case. So we do work very closely with Labelbox. So we actually invested in, like Databricks invested in, in Labelbox uh, last funding round. But if it's specifically around like these, like how to manage these different like, uh, labels over time as things start to drift, like certain libraries like FastAI has some interesting tools that like allow you to get a sense of which images you might have mislabeled through that process. Um, and so I think like one, th one thing that we've used in the past is we've like labeled a very small data set and then we've gone through done transfer learning to predict the labels from there and then just went through and kind of manually like, like went through all of those images and managed like the uh, made sure that they were properly labeled. And that was kind of one way to cut corners, where you're basically using the model to like, like predict those labels. And then you're going through and you're just validating that it's accurate. Um, I'm not sure if you had anything to yeah, add Yeah, I think the, like, the, the tools that I've seen most frequently are like Labelbox and Snorkel is another one that I've seen pretty frequently. Um, but again, those are both like proprietary-based solutions. Um, so I think, yeah, the, the best way to approach that from an open source like mindset is definitely going to be to kind of have that that transfer learning process that like meta model almost to, to generate those labels. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Awesome.
Awesome. Thank you again, speakers. And everybody, if you get a chance to review the session, please show your appreciation with reviews. And thank you to the sound crew for making all this happen. Great.